Uh, I'm John Urschel. I'm a fourth year mathematics PhD student at MIT. Okay. Uh, I'm Sanjeev Arora, and uh, I'm a professor in computer science at Princeton University, and a visiting professor in mathematics at the Institute for Advanced Study. Great. All right, so I asked to speak with you. Of all the sort of laureates and people here, I have to say that, you know, I, I do sort of feel a connection to you because I have read many of your papers. A lot of the stuff you've done sort of relates to things I'm interested in and things I do. For instance, uh, I've looked at your Euclidean TSP papers, my advisor's Michelle Gomez. So, you know, we've, we've been looking at asymmetric traveling salesmen, looking at Ola's recent results. Mm -hmm. uh, I've looked at your work in K-medians. It seems like my thesis is probably going to center around uh, sort of things related to K-means okay. for uh, continuous signals. Oh, I see. Yeah, so these, it's these things called uh, centroidal Voronoi tessellations, or they call it vector quantization. Okay. Yeah, from... That I've heard of, yeah. Yeah, so it's just uh, synonyms for the same thing. So yeah. I think my thesis is largely going to be about this. I have one paper from last year about this where I, uh, I looked at the sort of local geometry of the uh, associated functional. So for k-medians, it's the sum of sort of distances mm -hmm. from points to the closest center. Mm -hmm. For k-means, it's distance squared from points to the closest center. Yeah. And this is the discrete functional. Yeah. The continuous version is instead of, you know, you have n points and k centers, you have k centers, and you have some probability density function, let's say, p. Yeah. And now instead of sums, you're integrating. And you can think of, you know, these discrete endpoints as being sampled from this, you know, as samples from some, right. um, what's the word I'm looking for? Samples from some... The density. Yes, from the density, but I was thinking, from the population is what yeah. I would say, uh -huh. in some way. And asking questions about if you have a minimum, let's say Lloyd's algorithm converges to some local minimum, what can you say about the local geometry? Mm -hmm. Namely in sort of any dimension, which can be tough because sort of in high dimension cells do strange things when yeah. you perturb centers, asking what does the local geometry look like in terms of sort of variational calculus. So what does the first variation look like and what does the second variation look like? And uh, from this, you can actually gain conditions for which, given a density, you're guaranteed for there to be one unique minimum. Okay. And that means Lloyd's algorithm will converge to the global minimum. Okay. Oh, that sounds very interesting. Yeah, yeah. So that was, uh, that was sort of something I've been doing, and I've been looking at, you know, a number of different things in that area. Uh, yeah, it's interesting you say that, because that does span my interest back then, mm -hmm. the discrete optimization with interests which are in machine learning now, and uh, the, your result seems to bridge those two. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I don't know, I find it a sort of interesting area, but I'm also very sort of interested in your newer work, sort of looking at, you know, neural networks from a theoretical perspective, which I have to admit, I'm not, you know, a big deep learning person. I haven't studied this deeply. I've, I think just about all I know from about neural networks is sort of the one lecture Anker begrudgingly gave it in his sort of topics in machine learning okay. course. So, okay. but, uh, I'm curious about sort of the, I guess I should say the sort of newer results that have been coming out, both yours, uh, Cliven's paper from mm -hmm. this past year that mm -hmm. seemed very interesting to me because this idea of sort of neural networks is somewhat of an old idea. Yes. And the sort of techniques of this field are sort of very well established. I mean, this is really like approximation theory, like, you know, I think like sort of like Ron DeVore, sort of old school, yeah. which I'm curious sort of what class of new techniques are coming out or being used to obtain sort of stronger results than say classical type results for these things. Okay, so um, indeed the basic idea of deep learning uh, on neural nets is quite old, maybe 60 years old or more. Uh, but uh, so, okay, so just with those ideas, uh, 50, 60 year old ideas, you can get quite far. Uh, uh, but 
In the last five, six years, there have been many other innovations which have really improved the state of the art uh, in deep learning. And uh, so things like uh, batch normalization, res residual nets, dense nets. Mm -hmm. So, um, and you can think of these new techniques as really as new architectures. And, um, and those architectures seem much easier to train for some reason that we, we're still trying to understand in most cases. And uh, they fit the data better as well, they generalize better. So all the good stuff. And uh, those are due to architecture changes actually. So you can call the architecture change an algorithm change as well, mm -hmm. but, uh, but that's, those are some of the main ideas which have really improved the state of the art. Gotcha, interesting. Yeah. And those are all from the last five, five years or so. Really? Yes. The one thing that I've been interested in, I, uh, I'm not sure you saw this, but because I, um, part of my background is from numerical analysis, I saw an interesting paper maybe about a month or two ago, sort of looking at neural networks with sort of a uh, ReLU activation yes. and showing an equivalence between sort of a function approximation using the structure and actually a finite element approximation spaces of a function. Okay. Which was, yeah, it was really interesting, the idea of sort of, you're trying to approximate some function by this neural network, and it's actually equivalent to approximating the function on some finite element space. Because this rectified linear, sort of, you can show that any finite element, say, space can be represented in the form of, say, a rectified linear you know, neural network. But the thing that was non-trivial to me is that all sort of rectified linear neural networks can be represented by some you know, adaptive finite element space. So rectified linear networks are piecewise linear. Yeah. So, uh, but but I'm not sure what finite element means, but I guess uh, it must be non-trivial to show this then. Yeah, yeah, it seemed, so this, this is used in like uh, the theory of elliptic partial differential equations. Okay. So you have some differential equation and you're trying to solve this approximately. And of course, you know, the space of, you know, functions, some Sobolev space, this is infinite dimensional. Okay. So what you do is you look at a finite dimensional subspace of it. Okay. And the finite dimensional subspace is based off, you know, you can base it off a number of things, but one thing is you can associate it with a grid mm -hmm. and let's say hat functions and the set of sort of linear functions that come from this. And it's actually non-trivial to show that the interplay between the two is actually in a very natural way. And it doesn't uh, blow up the size yes. in either direction. Yeah. yeah, that's probably the non-trivial yeah, yeah. part, yeah. I see. Yeah, yeah. So I was, yeah. I don't know why I thought of that, but I, I saw that like six weeks ago, and I was interested. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh, I guess in general, I should ask you questions about sort of advice for young mathematicians. I mean, mm -hmm. you're someone who's you know accomplished so much. You know, especially your work on you know PCP, your work on you know Euclidean TSP, and just a number of things. Your work in sort of deep learning right now, what advice would you have for young researchers who aspire to make contributions like you have? Uh, I think uh, it, it's a good idea to not have a preconceived idea of what you want to work on mm -hmm. and react to the environment and to interesting questions as they come up. Um, so I think that's always been something I have liked to do in my own career, you know, as opposed to other colleagues who, who take an area and make it their own for decade, two decades, three decades. Mm -hmm. um, as I've always liked to explore new things every few years. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's my preferred mode of, gotcha. uh, of research. Um, yeah, because often people uh, are looking at questions in the old ways that they've been looking at, and sometimes a newcomer can can see something new, like happened with Euclidean TSP. I mean, I'd, yeah, yeah. yeah, there were all these traveling salesman problem experts, and 
mm -hmm. somehow as an outsider I could come in and see wait there's a simple structure here mm -hmm. so yeah um, if you do it often enough with enough problems at some point you you get lucky gotcha <laughs> is there well I'm, I mean there's there's got to be something to that in the sense of yes you've moved around from different areas but there's there's clearly something going on in terms of sort of when you come to an area that, you know, let's say you clean in TSP that has all these experts, I think part of the thing that most likely helps is that you have some unique tool set or some unique perspective that perhaps other people in that field haven't had. And what has been your approach sort of throughout your career in terms of trying to learn new techniques, trying to learn sort of more tools in your toolkit and what sort of approaches have you taken to make sure that you sort of you're always learning new ideas and new techniques that can help you because you do sort of move around from area to area. So I imagine that's your main sort of workhorse. Uh, yeah, I guess maybe the main uh, ingredient, which I don't, I think often people don't realize is that is not to be afraid of problems. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, don't assume that just because you're new or haven't studied before, you don't have something to contribute. Because in computer science, all our problems are fairly close to the source. And it's not like mathematics where there's a 100 years of development. And mm -hmm. uh, it's pretty hard to, to see something that other, others have missed. But I think our problems are rather new. And sometimes even the statement of the problem is not clear, right? You, mm -hmm. you see, OK, if I change the, this, this has been true in, in my machine learning work, that if you change the problem definition a little bit, mm -hmm. So that, you know, f for everybody, it would still be basically the same problem. But yeah. for theory, it can make a big difference. And so, yeah, not to be afraid of the problem and be willing to change the problem if need be slightly so that it's still in the same spirit, but uh, very valuable to solve. So, gotcha. yeah, so if you're not scared of the problem, I think that's already half the battle won. Gotcha. And in terms of the techniques, I think, Mm -hmm. um, there's no end to things you could learn. So mm -hmm. uh, I find it always useful to learn on the job. Yeah. Uh, you're faced with a problem and you explore and you, you see what needs to be done for it. I mean, most of what we do doesn't require very deep mathematics. So mm -hmm. um, you can learn whatever else you need to learn and understand it and apply it. Gotcha. Yes. All right, so shifting gears, how is, uh, how's the week been so far for you here at the Laureate Forum? Oh, it's very interesting, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a pretty unique uh, event. Um, it's my first time, so. Ah, congratulations, yeah. my, my first as well, <laughs> obviously. So, yeah, it's been only uh, uh, less than two days, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it seems it's wonderfully organized in a beautiful location, all these smart people. Uh, kind of the who's who of computer science here. Yeah, yeah. that's true. So, yeah, it's mm -hmm. very stimulating. Um, how has the event been for you for interacting with, uh, for interacting with uh, the laureates? Uh, the event's been wonderful thus far. I mean, the, uh, the first night I had dinner with Bill Phillips, and he was, you know, as lively as he always is, telling us old stories about, you know, how certain physical measurements came to be and changed over time. And throughout the whole process, it's only been two days, I've been able to meet with a ton of different laureates, pick their brains, and sort of, you know, learn something about how they think and sort of how they came to make the contributions they did. Now, the two of you decided to talk to each other, yeah. um, and you explained, I mean, I didn't understand the mathematics mm -hmm. behind it all, um, but I suppose what, well, it's both of your first times, so, yes. um, you know, what, what have you found from, from the students, from the, from the researchers, you know, have, have you gotten any, I know a, few, a day has gone by or two days since we last talked, um, you know, what, what has happened with you in the last couple of days with the student interactions? Uh, yeah, I was introduced to some new problems. Uh, um, some student, actually he was a postdoc, was working on breaking crypto systems 
via analog attacks. I don't know if you've heard of these, like no, what is measuring this? the power and things like that. No, I don't know what this is. Can you give me a Yeah, so, uh, so this is an old idea, okay. actually maybe even maybe a couple of decades old, mm -hmm. uh, that you observe the power consumption mm -hmm. of a chip that's carrying out the computations. Okay. So let's say you have physical access and you put a power meter or, or measure the heat dissipation or something. Okay. And uh, from that, you can actually, in some cases, break the crypto system. Just by telling what? Yeah. Interesting. So this is an old, very old trick. Uh -huh. Yeah. I mean, by the standards of computer science, meaning a couple of decades old. Right. And it's been sharpened over the years. But uh, what was interesting was that um, for more complicated settings mm -hmm. uh, where you don't necessarily have a good model for how the power is mm -hmm. uh, dissipated in the cryptographic computation. Mm -hmm. You just throw a deep learning task at it. So you, uh, you uh, feed it input-output behavior, right? Mm -hmm. And you measure the power mm -hmm. consumption. It sort of learns to correlate the two. And, right. and that seems to work pretty well empirically. Interesting. <laughs> this is really, I mean, I, I have heard of this sort of concept briefly through, you know, yeah, through friends, but this is, that's, yeah. So, there, yeah, I think in general, it's, um, it's an emerging paradigm that some things are just too complicated for humans to, like, put, you know, even if they have 100 variables or 500 mm -hmm. variables, it's just too big for humans to reason about. Yeah. But it's not too big for a deep net to reason mm -hmm. <laughs> about and determine the relationships of those. A few dozen variables. Gotcha. Interesting. Yeah, so they were not just looking at power, but like uh, uh, emission of electromagnetic waves, or, you know, all gotcha. kinds of other analog things. Mm -hmm. huh. Seems to me that um, I'm jumping in here, but it yeah, seems no, to me jump, that, jump that something like that, one of the, co the, the challenges is going to be the fineness of measurement, because if the, the processor is doing, you know, a billion tasks, you know, a billion flops, you know, how are you going to measure that, that variation? Yeah, no, so there's a more precise measurement idea, yeah, that uh, uh, this is in these uh, encryption standards, there's a very special chip, uh, and you measure its power consumption, not, not the full CPU. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. That's true. Uh, that was interesting. Yeah, so, yeah, you get a sort of snapshot of what young people are interested in. Mm -hmm. and yeah, that's been a lot of fun. Nice. Has this uh, experience changed uh, the way that you'll approach your own subject? I think, uh, I think saying, you know, changing the way I approach my subject is strong, but something I, I always enjoy about these sort of events and there's no sort of disrespect intended to the uh, sort of laureates, but I found that something that's been sort of equally sort of useful to me is just to be around other young researchers sure. in one big place. And this is something that I found is always useful to see what problems are other young people working on? Yeah. How do they think about these problems? Yeah. What are their approaches? And this is something that really puts your own research, I think, often in perspective. Yeah. yeah. And this is something I've really enjoyed, and I always enjoy sort of hearing the things that people are trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was alluding to earlier, that, yeah, when you look around you, there are all kinds of interesting problems. Mm -hmm. And uh, once in a while, something catches your fancy, and then you can jump in and do, do something with it. Yeah, no, that's true. Now, on the other side, if, if I may ask you, um, I assume that you know some of the laureates here already. Um, uh, yeah. Have you have you met any new ones that were sort of like your heroes and 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 who or anyone you didn't know before who kind of surprised you? Well, they're all exceptional people. Uh, so in some sense, they're you know all heroes, uh, intellectual heroes. So um, uh, anybody. Just running through who all I met. Uh, I think it's um, what's interesting in in these events is to you know have a sort of conversation at a more personal level, which you wouldn't normally have with people of that caliber 
outside my own subdiscipline, um, and uh, and that and that was interesting because um, life is a continuing process, and uh, it's always useful to to see how some of those people are gotcha. coping with various things in life and how their life has evolved. So I think at a personal level, that's very interesting. Gotcha. Have you been, I'm curious, have you been exploring the city at all? Did you come by yourself or with family? And no, I came with my wife, but she left this morning. Ah, uh, she had to go back? Or? Yeah. Gotcha. And um, we, yeah, we went walking yesterday. Mm -hmm. Instead of doing the city tour, mm -hmm. we uh, just went for a walk by ourselves up on the hill. And oh, nice. How'd you, how'd you like it? It was nice, yeah. It's called the Philosopher's Walk. Ah, okay. Yeah. I also didn't do the city tour, but uh, when I came here, I took the train, and so I walked through the whole city on the way from the train to my hotel. It's a, yeah. it's a nice city. How long have you been married? Uh, 25, 24 years. I just got married uh, three months ago. Oh, congratulations. Now you have any, any advice? <laughs> <laughs> See, this is the uh, advice I really need. Yeah, uh, yeah I think... Uh, uh, my marriage is, a, is one of the best things that happened to me, so mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, if not the best, actually, I should say. And uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it's a source of constant joy and love, so it's lovely. Um, yeah. Good, 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 good answer. Sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, this is, I'm saying the same thing in case you know, my significant uh, um, other is watching. So. Yeah. Um, but you know, it also, yeah, it grows in, in ways over the years and uh, you have to make time for each other and mm -hmm. enjoy each other. And, yeah, no, it's, uh, I don't know, I feel like it's, uh, I'm sure it's a balance between sort of, you know, academics, you know, and, you know, problems that you're so sort of passionate about, but also, you know, making sure to not neglect time with, you know, your family, your wife, and your yeah. children, you know, finding the right balance. And I think, I don't know about you, but I think, uh, I think academia is pretty well suited to that. Yeah, uh, I agree. Uh, it can be, if you, I mean, it allows you, you to, yeah. yeah. Uh, some people may not make optimum use of that freedom, but yes, uh, I tend to. Gotcha. Yeah, I think that's important. Because okay. career is very long, yeah. The, you know, paper deadlines are not so important, you know. Yeah. Fine, if you don't finish it by this deadline, go for the next deadline. Okay. Uh, yeah, we okay. Whereas, you know, time sort of like, you know, when your child is growing up, you know, yeah. you, you can't get those years back. That's right. Yeah. Plus, you also need to, anyway, put away the books to recharge and refresh. Yeah, this is true. Uh, so. Yeah, do you have any interesting hobbies? Any unexpected hobbies? I'm curious. Uh, I don't know about unexpected. Yeah, I mean, some of them are like the usual ones, uh, listening to music or uh, reading books. Yeah. Um, I've dabbled in various other things uh, off and on, you know, Painting. Uh, uh, I do uh, for the last ten years various kinds of like physical improvement things. Now Around finally doing no 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 like oh. physical like improving yourself like tai chi. Ah, gotcha. Yeah, uh, I, I've moved around in various things and mm -hmm. ended up at tai chi some years ago. And Interesting. So uh, yeah, otherwise you know kids keep you busy and mm. we do a lot of travel okay. a fair bit yeah. gotcha. all right I'm gonna ask favorite book since you said you love reading I need to I'm gonna put you on the oh, spot favorite yes favorite that's tough yeah no no top five lists are happening here uh, even five would be tough yeah uh, no, that's a tough one yeah because favorite sometimes you know you you like a book because it was right for the, mm -hmm. the stage of life you were in. Yeah. And then you go back 20 years later and years later. you don't... I'm with you. Maybe you don't have that experience because 20 years ago you were what? Yeah, 20 years ago I was seven. But no, I have this experience, you know, I was a, you know, a young kid in high school and maybe a certain book had a huge impact on me. Yeah. And I look back now and I said, really? Yeah. Like, yeah. But okay, so. this moment in time, right here, we're at Heidelberg. 
We're here, we're sitting, we're chatting. This moment in time, what book comes to your mind? Oh my gosh. Yeah, I'm putting you on the spot right now. Yeah, that's a tough one too, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, I'll let you go. I'll let you, <laughs> I'll, I'll let this one slide. Yeah. I actually, you know, it's not just books, you know, I also, yeah, read like, yeah, uh, the, the New Yorker every mm -hmm. week. Pretty much oh, really? Yeah. My, uh, my wife's, uh, she's a writer for the New Yorker. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, we should, I, I should look up her work, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, I read that uh, every That's week. Uh, pretty much, yeah, most articles in it. Uh, things like that, yeah. Gotcha. Yes. You know, this is all kind of, one of the things that I ask, uh, mm -hmm. that I, I ask the laureates is, um, you know, what do you hope that, that the researchers take away? And a surprisingly large percentage say, um, I, some variation on, I want them to see that, you know, I'm just a person, mm -hmm. you know, and sort of this whole discussion is kind of reflective of that. It's, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm not a stone uh, statue. I do things like have hobbies and read books and so on. And, you know, it's just a, my research is a part of my life as opposed to being all of my life. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, otherwise, uh, yeah, I, don't, I, I imagine you would go crazy if all you did was research yeah, yeah. all the time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean... Not to mention it would hurt your research, too. Yeah, that's, that's, that's true. I mean, math is pretty... I mean, I, allow me, I hope you allow me to sort of treat sort of theoretical computer science as math. Okay. But, uh, you know, math is, I'm, math is pretty amazing and sort of it's on the way in and this is, I'm, this is, you know, your life's passion and this is my life's passion, but there's, there's so much sort of in this world to do and experience and, mm -hmm. yeah. So our viewers may not know that uh, you were also a professional ba uh, football player. Yes, so yes. how did those two very different events, uh, interests, uh, a lineup in your case? Yeah, no, that's uh, it's an interesting question. When I was uh, when I was a kid, I always loved puzzles, and I was always so curious. I always wanted to know the answer why to things. Uh -huh. And so math, I never really, I never realized how much I loved math until I got to college and started taking proofs-based courses. Uh -huh. And uh, then I sort of started to experience research and. I realized that you know a lot of sort of math research is very much like very hard high level puzzles, mm -hmm. and this is something that you know I just absolutely was drawn to. Okay. Whereas I uh, I started out in aerospace engineering mm -hmm. because my mother told me I would be an aerospace engineer. So, okay. Yeah. This is, you know you're a high school kid going to college. You'd, yeah. I did what my mom told me. Okay. But uh, football, my father played uh, college football, and. Uh, it was something that you know I knew was in my family, and so in high school I started playing, and it turned out I had an aptitude for it. And I think very much I just sort of went down these parallel paths mm -hmm. without ever giving it much thought about you know the sort of workload of both. Although when I was playing in the NFL, I have to say the decision to uh, start my PhD while I was in the NFL. Yeah. Probably not my best decision in hindsight. It was uh, like, you know, the f during the fall, because, you know, I'm working a full time job and, you know, profession, more than a full time job. Uh -huh. And then I'm trying to, you know, read these books and hand in my assignments, you know, via, you know, fax while I'm, you know, in Baltimore taking classes at MIT. That was, that was tough for me. That was quite a tough endeavor. And I think I sort of, uh, I really neglected a lot of other areas of my life because of that. Yeah. So I, I loved my time playing college football. I loved my time playing in the NFL. But I'm thankful that, you know, for the past year now, I've been able to just focus on math, and I'm going into the fourth year of my PhD. So it's good to be able to, you know, focus. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's an amazing story. <laughs> uh, yeah, to take all those courses at MIT remotely and do the homework, and that's amazing. Yeah, my. Uh, my fiance at the time did not think it was. She did not enjoy it <laughs> so much, but uh, yeah, but no, it was. Uh, yeah, it was an interesting, interesting time of my life in general. Sort of the things student athletes 
sort of end up having to sort of deal with and do in the United States, I think it can be really, really tough on their education, uh -huh. especially, you know, at, you know, sort of big time institutions. That's right. Yeah. So like if you're, you know, a college football player at say Alabama or some big sort of, it's, it's extremely, it's non-trivial. Yeah. Yeah. It's non-trivial. Yeah. yeah. So I was lucky that I really loved math. <laughs> like I would wake up in the morning and just be excited to wake up early, work out, do my training, and then get to sort of math and reading and learning. And you know, mm -hmm. this was this was like my dessert. And so, mm -hmm. if I was majoring in history, I would not have been a good student because you know, I, okay, I gotta go to class, I gotta do this homework. Whereas, I don't know, it was always like my it was always my dessert. And who doesn't have time for dessert? So, I see. You know. Yeah, yeah, it's still my dessert. Yeah, I mean, I really look forward to yeah. spending the day in my office and mm -hmm. talk to my students and postdocs, and yeah. that's all I do. Yeah, I don't yeah. pretty much most days. That's all I do mm -hmm. in, at work. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing, right? I mean, this is one of the things where. So I'm not many people can say they're re not retired at 27, yeah. and. I feel like I'm going to be fully retired the rest of my life in the sense that sort of being an academic, being a professor, it's you're getting paid for things that sort of I feel like I would do for free. Like I love, you know, I love teaching. I love, you know, trying to convey topics and inspire young people. And you get paid as an academic to, you know, you go into the office and think mm -hmm. and try to, you know, work on these problems. And what problems do you work on? Mm -hmm the problems you want to work on, yeah. the things that interest you, the things that excite yeah. you. Yeah. And then you get to try to inspire young people. And this is, I don't know, I feel like it's, uh, it's like the best kept secret is that. Actually, you didn't mention one thing that I really like, yes. which is maybe the, even the most important thing, mm -hmm. that the young people teach me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess I haven't gotten a chance to see yeah. this yet. Yeah. Well, you've been probably teaching your advisors Perhaps. all along without realizing it. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, as I said, if, if you work on new things, mm -hmm. uh, one thing that it really is good for is that it, it uh, levels the playing field between me and my student. Mm -hmm. And so um, we are both equally ignorant. Mm -hmm. I may have a little bit more experience navigating the terrain mm -hmm. based on past experience, but um, otherwise we are on an equal footing. and. They're younger and smarter. <laughs> so, yeah, it's not clear who's doing better, right? So I have a little bit more experience and they've got uh, uh, the, the young brain. So, uh, yeah, it's really thrilling to, to do the research and figure out things together. Mm -hmm. uh, no, that's good to hear that you sort of, uh, that you value the process of sort of uh, advising, you know, PhD students because... They're yeah. my teachers. Also, yeah, mm -hmm. I seriously say that, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I learned so much from my students. Because I could not get into, you know, new topics like this very easily, right? It's, you know, you've seen this before, that when you're working with other people, it's so much easier to pick up material and mm -hmm. figure out a new area. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a joy to have really smart young students uh, around as this, uh, environment and I learned so much from them. That's awesome to hear. What else? I don't know, that's a pretty good uh, finale. I think. Mm -hmm. Okay.